Good morning, all. Today is Thursday. And you know I said the same thing yesterday? <laughs> I was so confused. By the time I got to sharing with you all, uh, I walked back into the house and Michelle said, today's Wednesday. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Guess my days are running into uh, each other as well. And I probably shouldn't take up the role of calendar and weatherman uh, every day. Nevertheless, um, it actually is Thursday today. So happy Thursday to everyone. And uh, we are glad to see you. If you are joining us live, then uh, we are happy to have you signing in. We see Gail Adams there, our elder. So we're always happy to see you present. Uh, we've got uh, Jane and the Mandernax who are on the phone and happy to have them as well. And others, I'm sure, will join us as uh, they have the opportunity and so whether you're joining us live today, as Jeff has just signed in, or if you're watching this at a time that is a little bit more convenient for you later, uh, we would welcome you to the encouragement for the day brought to you by the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ. Good morning, Donna. Happy to have you. Um, so... Why not just hasten on to our subject today, if you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do. My encouragement to you is to grab it and to meet at Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32. Good morning, Doris. I sure miss you. You and the ladies who sit up front, Susie uh, and Jane, taking notes and all of that. It's just a delight to see your faces, and I miss them dearly. So I'm glad to know that we are connected in this way. Um, before I get started, I would also remind all the ladies that uh, Sophie Thompson is going to be conducting the second Thursday night ladies Bible study. So I would encourage you to utilize our computer credentials uh, to sign in either by phone or by webinar. And uh, she's going to make that available at seven o'clock tonight. I think I have that time right. Uh, I believe that she is also going to try to live stream on Facebook as well, because that tends to work well for us. Last night, we had our regular Bible study, and we were able to simulcast it on Facebook Live. And there were people, I mean, we had somebody from Seattle, somebody from California. We had people here from local. Uh, and then we had some folks that were on the phone. And we had really, I think we finally figured out how, how to have a legitimate class where it wasn't just me droning on incessantly, but people had comments, people had questions, people had ideas and thoughts, and it just went beautifully. I was very, very excited about it. I was very happy about it, and it worked very, very well. Uh, so I would encourage you in the future to join us on Wednesday nights at 6.30 and Sunday mornings at 9.30. And uh, let's have discussion. Let's have class. Let's uh, utilize the technology that we have now that it seems to be working uh, for the purposes uh, which I think it is best utilized uh, to share the Word of God. So glad uh, glad that we have that. Good morning, uh, Jan. I'm sure Dave's with you. Terry, always glad to see you as well. Tom Cole and the lovely Catherine, I am sure. Terry, glad to have you too. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Verse 32. And... Uh, I'm going to proceed from a subject of stay woke. Now, chances are some of you may not have heard that particular expression. That's okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with my grammar. Um, I am an educated person. <laughs> However, I am utilizing today's vernacular to describe something, which I'll share with you in just a moment. But what this ultimately is going to um, have to do with is sleep. So I'd like to start today's discussion around the topic of sleep. Now, with this word comes several thoughts, of course. Uh, there is the literal meaning of the word sleep. We know what sleep is. We lay down, we close our eyes, we rest, our heart rate lowers, um, we, we, we become unconscious, and um, you know, all the things that go on in sleep, that's kind of your business, whatever you dream about or how much you toss and turn, we know what sleep is. Right? So we, we certainly can think of that. 
um, as it relates to one of the several thoughts that may come to mind when we mention the word sleep. And I wonder, I wonder, family, how much are we sleeping in in this in these days of COVID-19? Uh, some of us still have jobs to uh, report to, whether we have to leave the house or whether we're working from the house. Um, and then some of us don't. And I wonder if we have that flexibility if we're sleeping in, if we're sleeping more. I wonder. Hmm. Um, and then another aspect of the word is to underestimate or to discount something or to be unaware. A classic business example of what I'm saying is, and again, underestimate, discount, be unaware. Many of us know Kodak. Um, we remember the Kodak cameras. We remember the Kodak film. We remember that great song, Mama Don't Take My Coat Crumb, Mama Don't Take My Coat Crumb Away, right? I, you, <laughs> I know, child of the 60s. But um, Kodak was a big company. And typically, if you thought about pictures, you thought about Kodak. Did you know, family, that Kodak had the patent on the digital camera? They had the patent on the digital camera. Now, their business was going so well with selling cameras and paper, processing equipment, and especially chemicals, that they used, they, they kept that technology on the shelf and they continued to focus on their cash cow, the thing that was making them money. Well, guess what? Somebody got a hold of that technology and whether they got a hold of it from them or whether they developed it independently. The digital idea of capturing images took off. Now, Kodak, who had first dibs on the technology, did not leverage that technology. And ultimately, it caused them to go out of business. In the meantime, there is scarcely a person alive that does not have a digital camera. And I'm not necessarily talking about the big Canons and Nikons and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, the pictures that we take with our phone are digital pictures. <laughs> and so one could say that Kodak slept on digital technology. They discounted it. They underestimated it. They were unaware of the implications or the future or the applications that it could have. They did not utilize it or take advantage of it, thereby sleeping on it, thereby being out of business. And so that's another phraseology that we might utilize when we start thinking about sleeping, right? We understand what traditional physical sleep is, but we also understand that there is this other definition of sleeping or sleeping on something, okay? Now, I bring that up because today's encouragement, family, is about both of these concepts wrapped into one. Can you guess where we're going today? You know, it was um, just after the Last Supper uh, where Jesus informed his closest associates that they would all fall away. He says, you know, they're going to come and grab the shepherd and the sheep will scatter just as it was written in the book of Zechariah. Peter, of course, protested, despite being told that he in particular would deny Christ three times before the first rooster crowed. And the others also protested and denied. Which brings us to our passage for today, Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Here, the Bible says that they, Jesus and his apostles, because they had just had the Last Supper and they had gone to the Mount of Olives and were talking amongst themselves and he was going to go up into the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the Mount of Olives. And he said to them, sit here until I have prayed. Now, what had happened prior to this is that all the disciples were together with the exception of one, Judas, because, well, you know, Judas. He had gone to uh, get the soldiers, and we find out about that a little bit later. So that left 11. Eight of them 
he left at the entrance to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he had three others go with him. Those three, Peter, James, and John, also known as the inner circle. They tended to be the closest ones to Jesus, and typically when there was something in particular going on, they were around and they were involved. So again, eight of the apostles were posted at the entrance to the garden. Three remained closest to him. And um, what was happening was something that Jesus had shared with them a number of times. He had talked about it in his uh, conversations with them and some of his conversations with others, the wider group of disciples. He had always said that this day would come and now the day had come. So in verse 33, the Bible says that he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Now, I'm sure we all know where we are now. Jesus is wrestling with the fact that his time of sacrifice had come. He is going into a prayer posture where he's going to talk to God and he's going to wrestle with what he has to do. Up until now, he had carried out the mission obediently. Up until now, he had uh, taken care of those who God had delivered into his care. He had taught them, discipled them. Um, empowered them, all the things that he was supposed to do. He had completed his mission on earth, and now he was going into the pinnacle, into the climax, into the most difficult part of it. And Jesus had some concerns. Look at what the Bible says again. He began to be very distressed and troubled. He told his guys, uh, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death family. I mean, I don't know if we can put ourselves in that mindset. Uh, it may not be possible because of the implications of the time, because of the foreknowledge that Jesus had about what was going to happen to him, um, and not just the beatings that would come and the humiliation that would come and the trials and the disrespect and so on and so forth, but ultimately upon that cross, the pain all of those kinds of things, but there was going to come a point where there would be a separation between God the Father and God the Son, which perhaps was the most agonizing aspect of it. That's not what our lesson is today, but I'm trying to get you to a point where you can at least come to an intellectual knowledge of what he meant when he talked about this distress, this trouble, and this deep grieving of his soul to the point of death. Um, we talk about depression all the time. We talk about anxiety all the time. I mean, this is that times a million. Uh, we, we're amateurs when it comes to that as it relates to Jesus from a relative perspective here. He was hurting, terrified. And he asked his guys, remain here. Stay here. I'm going to go a little bit further and have this private session with my father. You guys watch and pray, watch and pray, remain here, keep watch. Now, the implication here is that Jesus revealed to his inner circle, his inner thoughts in all of their time together. They had never seen him like this. He had always been able to outsmart people, out Bible people, heal people, turn back the accusations and some of the scoffings of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and such. He was always ahead of the game. But to see him in this situation where he, in the vernacular that I might use otherwise, he was torn down, torn up and torn down. And it must have been really something for them to see him in that state. It had to be concerning to him, perhaps even alarming like, what, what, is, what is going on? I mean, you, you've been sort of on a downer since dinner. And then that whole thing about us scattering and thinking I'm going to betray you. And what is, what is this? Imagine how confusing this could be after they had seen him do so much and be so much. Some may have even continued to expect him to start the revolution. You know, there were people who said, well, this is the Messiah and he's going to 
restore us and defeat our enemies, the Romans. And, you know, this is going to be a worldwide movement. And here we are right next to the master. I mean, there are some who undoubtedly thought that that was still going to happen. It wasn't because that wasn't the plan. <laughs> they just didn't know that. So he says, keep watch. What do you suppose he meant by keep watch? I don't know if you've ever had to deal with the death of a loved one. Um, and I'm a living witness of, well, you know what? We're not going to talk about that. Here's what we're going to do. We'll talk about Job. How about that? We can look at Job's situation in chapter 2. With all the things that had happened to him, we, we, we studied that recently, uh, where he lost his entire family. He lost all of his belongings. He lost his health. Um, and then his wife says, why don't you curse God and die? I mean, he couldn't have been any lower. He was grieving um, at a level that was just unimaginable. I mean, just unimaginable. Here's what happened. The Bible says, now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite, and they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. When they lifted their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. Each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. I've shared with you in the past that that was in that culture at that time, a way of expressing deep mourning, ashes and tearing your clothes. And then this happened. The Bible says this, which is something I think is just really important. Then they sat with him down on the ground for seven days. And seven nights with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. And so what we see here, family, is that in Job's anguish, he had someone come alongside and sit with him silently, mourn with him. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, but weep with those who weep. You know, there's a, there's, there's a, a colloquialism that says misery loves company. Uh, the idea is, is that when we're in deep anguish, we need support. We need company. We need someone on whom we can lean on, rest on, just lay our burdens on, or at least know that there's somebody there who loves us and just keeps us from feeling, feeling completely alone. And so when Jesus says, watch with me, that's what he means. He means this. He means do what these guys did for Job. That's all he was asking after all they had been through, after all that he had shown them, shared with them, done with them, done through them, and done for them. In this critical hour of anguish, confusion, and fear, just watch with me. That's what I brought you here for. You know, family, sometimes in tragedy, you just need those closest to you to just be there and go through it with you. And here's another thought. Another thought is the watch night that happened during Passover. I won't spend any time on this, but just recall that when that last plague was going through Egypt, um, Moses told the people to watch, right? Be in your homes, close your doors, make sure you've got the blood where it's supposed to be, and just watch, it's a watch night because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to die. You be still, you be quiet, and you just be on watch. Watch what God's going to do. Watch how God is going to execute on his plan. and Watch how he's going to preserve you. Watch how you're going to be saved. That's going to be important. Verse 35 of our passage. The Bible says then Jesus then went a little beyond them, and he fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. He was saying, Abba, Father. And we all know that Abba is the very intimate daddy would be our equivalent. So it's not the great God of heaven, creator of all things. It's dad. 
You know, he's crying out to him. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. He's begging to have his life preserved. Yet, not what I will, but you will. Found it's difficult to express the utter anguish he must have felt. He was terrified, once again, confused. His godliness must have been at war with his humanity. Because his godliness says, this is why you came. And if you don't do what it is that you came to do, then you won't be the Messiah that you are. You just won't. You'd be a guy who was a great teacher. You'd be a prophet, but you wouldn't be the Messiah. All of this would have been for naught. But his humanness <laughs> knew what was waiting for him. The pain, the agony, the public humiliation, the scoffing, the spitting, the beating, the crown of thorns, the gambling for my garments, <laughs> looking over at my mom and seeing how brutally she was suffering. His humanity didn't want to go through that, and who could blame him? That's why he prayed to God, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this, but I will. Notice also that he fell to the ground to pray. The typical posture of Easterners back in those days was to stand with their arms lifted up to God, with their hands lifted up. That was the typical attitude and posture of prayer. This tells us that he went into the garden and fell on his face. We call that praying from a prostrate position. And that typically is indicative of spiritual anguish. I mean, when you are hurting, when you are sorrowful, when you are dead guilty, um, that's how you pray. It's like you can't get low enough to the ground. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been there, family, <laughs> but I have. And um, I mean, that's just sometimes, and usually that doesn't happen without lots and lots of tears. I mean, you know, when I get up, the carpet's wet. Um, because that's, I mean, you, you're just trying to humble yourself and get as low as you possibly can to get to God. And this is what he was doing. And if that weren't bad enough, verse 37, he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? C could you not watch with me for one hour? Listen, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. Oh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Hmm. This was a stinging rebuke, family. A stinging rebuke. And I I'd like you to notice this because here again, I just, I love studying the Bible. I love studying the Bible with you. And I love pointing out these things that most folks would miss. And I'm not saying anything about myself that I'm all that brilliant or anything like that. But I just notice these things and I share them with you. Uh, that's why I like class because you may notice some things and share it with me that I hadn't thought of. But notice this. The Bible says, he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, right? So that tells me that he's addressing a particular individual. There's three guys there, but he's talking specifically to Peter. And what does he say to Peter? What's the first word he says to Peter? Simon. Now, I would imagine that that probably gets past most of us. It got past me. <laughs> the reference is to Peter by whoever's writing this, but the word used, the address is Simon. Now, what's the big deal, Lee? Simon Peter, we are, it's the same person. Yes, you're right. However, Simon is his real name. Simon is his given name. But when Christ met him, he gave him a new name. He says, you're Peter, <laughs> also known as Cephas. Same thing, just depends on how it's pronounced in Greek versus uh, Aramaic, right? Uh, Peter, Cephas, which means stone. Simon, son of Barjona, right? But with us, you're Peter. And so Jesus gave him a new name. We know what it's like when God gives us a new name. Remember Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Uh, who was it? Mm, Jacob? Israel? So sometimes God gives you a new name for your new purpose. You're the rock, Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. He wasn't building a church on Peter. He was building a church on Peter's confession. Nevertheless, 
That's the difference between Petros and Petros. That's Greek. I'm into details I shouldn't be into. But the point here is that he didn't call him by the name that he gave him. He went back to who he was, Simon. You know, to me, that's like, um, I never hear Michelle call my name. It's always, hon, sweetie, babe, <laughs> you know, all that. And just every now and then, maybe five times since I've known her, she'll say, late, right? That gets my attention right away. It's like, that's not what you call me. <laughs> what, 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 what's going on? What did I do? Uh, and this is what he does. This is what he does to him. And that's, that's wow to me. That's, that's wow. He now referred to him in his natural uh, name rather than his given in grace name. Now, given Jesus' distress, this is understandable because I brought you up here as my inner circle for a specific purpose and you're not fulfilling that purpose. So he rebukes him. But then he also does something else. Watch this. He gives the warning to keep watching and praying. Listen, keep watching. Wake up. Get up. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Why does he tell him that? He says, so that you will avoid temptation. Now, he had just told him, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And you, and you fussed against that. You denied that. No, I'm, if I have to die with you, I'll die with you. That's what you said. Right. So the prayer is for you, not for me. You need to be in prayer because Satan has already attempted to sift you. Satan had desires to sift you as wheat. I've told you that. And when you told me, uh, when I told you guys that this night was going to come, and that I was going to go up to the cross and die and, you know, rebuild the temple in three days and all that. Uh, you, you tried to talk me out of it. And I had to rebuke you. Why? Because Satan is involved. You need to pray to avoid temptation. You need to stay awake. Watch and pray. And then he says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's a heavier statement than what you might think, family. We can look at that very generically and go, yes, we have the desire in our spirituality and in our relationship with God to make sure that we always do the right thing. But we're limited by our flesh and it causes us to do things that we ought not to do. Yeah, it's heavier than that. A willing spirit, but a weak flesh, watch this, is powerlessness due to prayerlessness. Did you get that? <laughs> He's telling them, watch and pray. But what's happening is you are sleeping. Your flesh is overcoming your spirit. I'm telling you to pray so that you would have the power to overcome your flesh and the things that tempt it. But because you are not willing to stay awake and pray, the flesh is winning. Your powerlessness is due to prayerlessness. And that's going to cost you. Family, listen. Box that up. Ask them to put that in a bag and take that home with you. And put it someplace where you can get it. Because we need to remember that for the rest of our lives. Powerlessness is due to prayerlessness. If you don't have a strong, active prayer life, you will have no power. God has already told us to be strong in the power of his might. We come connected to that by prayer. All right, verse 39. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. He's still just begging and pleading with God, wrestling with his humanity. Verse 40, and again he came, and, and again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him when he came back and confronted them. Incredible. And so we have to ask ourselves, why were they so sleepy? What, what's going on? I can tell you. Grief can do that to you. Now, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they knew what was going on. And they were so concerned and so worried and so heavy that they just fell asleep. Sometimes your body just shuts off. It's a, de it's a defense mechanism. Um, sometimes you, you need sleep to escape. 
Um, and I know that there are those of you out there who know what that is and know what that's about and how that works. That's, that's, that's a truth right there. Grieving in, in times of high anxiety, a lot of times you think, well, I just can't sleep, I can't sleep. And sometimes you just, that's all you want to do is sleep. That's the way depression works. It gets you away from things. It shuts you down so you won't have to deal with things. But that's giving him the benefit of the doubt. Because I would hate for it to be ignorance of what was going on. I would hate for it to be, oh, Jesus, he's just going on like he always does. And you just nod off. I would hope that that wasn't the case. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say why they were sleeping. It just says that they were. But I'd like for you to do this. Notice the answer, though. Because the Bible says he found them sleeping and for their eyes were heavy, but they did not know what to answer him. That's interesting to me because that's the same thing that happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. God, Jesus took these same three people up to the Mount of Transfiguration where they met God and they met Moses and they met Elijah. And who was it? Simon Peter. It's good for us to be here. We should build three tabernacles. The Bible says because they were terrified and he did not know what to say. Now, it's not my lesson to go into the three tabernacles, but I can tell you that that was an Olympic level faux pas. You don't build three tabernacles for the three people that were there. What's a tabernacle? It's a worship place. That's where God resided. And you're not going to worship Moses and you're not going to worship Elijah. And so you don't make three tabernacles. That's a whole other thing. But the, the, the key is, is that the same, same, same Simon Peter offered the same excuse. They didn't know what to say. So verse 41. He came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? <laughs> it's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays is at hand. And so we see here then that a third time had happened. Notice how the number three keeps coming up. <laughs> you know, it, that's interesting to me. But the third time he comes and finds them sleeping yet again. And you know what that does? It makes their failure complete. It's not that he came three times and two of those times they were awake and once they were asleep or some other iteration of three. Every single time he came back, when they were supposed to be praying with him, watching with him, sitting with him, just like Job's buddies did, Job's three buddies, um, they slept every time. So their failure was complete. And then what about those guys that were at the gate? There's no specific mention made of them anymore because those they did come and they did try to collect him and, you know, Peter with the sword and the ear and all that stuff. We don't hear about the ones, the eight that were left at the gate. So either they had already scattered or, as verse 50 tells us, they all left him and fled just as he had predicted that they would. It's important to know that this was not pre determined. In other words, Jesus didn't make that happen. It wasn't predetermined that they would do this. It was predicted <laughs> that they would do that. It was pre-known that they would do that. And he told them that this is what's going to happen. It didn't have to go that way. They could have stayed away. They could have done the right thing. They could have watched and prayed with him. So what's all that about, family? Why do we even go through all of that? Here's why. Today, as I've been telling you, we find ourselves with a golden opportunity to stand up for Jesus. Again, people are looking for answers. People are looking for God. People are looking for, for to understand. There are people who need things. Uh, just the, the numbers of folks who have died, I think it's what, 400-some um, thousand people have died? Is that right? Not to mention the, the 40 million people who have uh, applied for uh, unemployment. Who don't have jobs? It's prime time. We must represent Christ to men. And so my question to all of us, not to you, but to all of us, is shall we remain awake and diligent? Or shall we get lazy and sleep? We're all in the comfort of our homes. It's easy to be lazy. It's easy to sleep in. It's easy to get into all kinds of other little projects that serve you and not God. 
My question to all of us is how will the Lord find us during COVID-19 as he looks in on this situation? Will he find us asleep or will he find us watching and praying? Will he find us active? Will he find us representing him? And so our encouragement for today, as I said at the very top of this, another of today's sayings as it relates to our topic, stay woke. Stay woke. Yes, I could say stay awake, but the terminology is to stay woke, which is to stay awake. Remain aware. Remain focused. Pay attention because things are changing, things are happening, and much is at stake. We need to stay woke. Represent Christ and not let him come back and find us sleeping. Not let him come back. And find us giving in to temptation. Not let him come back and find that we have no answer. Stay woke. And here's a way that you can help stay woke. We've got a great conference coming up. I think I've shared with you before. If you would go, if not, well, you're on our Facebook page now. But I would encourage you uh, to scroll down a little bit and look for the Virtual Encouragement Conference. Virtual Encouragement Conference, whose topic is... In times like these, we've got six great preachers, um, present company excluded, uh, six six preachers who are going to bring uh, words and sermons of encouragement every night. We're going to have two on Wednesday night. I think one's going to start at 7 and the other one's going to start at 8. And then at 7.30 every night, Monday through Thursday, there's going to be a different guy. Uh, We've got uh, Joe from Fairgrove. No, he's Fairview Heights. That's right. Uh, We've got... um, Jerry Williamson, who is from Florissant, um, I'll be there representing uh, the Fairgrounds Road family. Conley Gibbs, who's going to be there with uh, the St. Louis um, Gateway Community Church. Who else do we have? Shane. Shane Hines from the O'Fallon Church of Christ, the Mighty O. And then we're going to wrap it, wrap it up with Ralph Smith. He's the elder statesman of the area. He's been out there at Centerville for almost 50 years. Uh, And so these guys have all come together just for the purposes of offering some encouragement. So I encourage you to tune in. There's going to be two different ways that you can check this out. There's a Facebook page that's designated for it. It's uh, it just do a search for St. Louis minister. That's S A I N T L O U I S one word minister. Um, There's a dedicated Facebook page there. And there's also a dedicated uh, YouTube page. And the YouTube page, do a search for STL Encouragement Conference um, 2020, and you'll find the page there. And so these sermons will be posted in both places at the appropriate time um, on the uh, appropriate nights. And I would just love it if you would uh, consider uh, not only viewing it, taking that all in, being encouraged by it, learning from it, uh, tell a friend, tell all your friends, anybody that you have influence with, tell them. Um... And we're doing this to support Churches of Christ disaster relief effort. Um, there's an organization, I remember, that's how I became aware of the Fairgrounds Road Church Crisis, that that organization, when we had flooding back, way, way, way back, it had to be somewhere around 2007, maybe, um, that they shipped all these goods up there. And they, they stored them with O'Fallon, which is where I was at the time, but uh, Fairgrounds was much closer to where the flooding was taking place. And so we worked together, and that's how I got to know them. And so that organization, so we're not collecting any money ourselves, but we're just suggesting that donations be made because they're collecting uh, money and buying uh, protective equipment for those who are on the front lines. And we want to support that. So um, please, please, please consider that. Please, please, please post it. There's an event that's set up. Go and say that you'll be there and share it and tell everybody that you know that we're going to be doing this. And let's just stay woke. Let's just do those things that God is calling upon us to do in these very critical times. Let's be encouraged. Let's do the things that the children of God ought to be doing. Thank you. Have a brilliant rest of the day. We'll see you tomorrow, Friday, 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 and we'll have another great lesson for you. Thank you as always. God bless.